Hi, everyone. Good evening. Carl Steinbeck here. Just want to talk tonight about some of the follow up uh, after looking at some more of the jail call rants of Charlie Adelson, mostly talking to his mother, Donna Adelson, who some days later, not too many days later, was arrested herself down in Miami. And now she's up there in the Leon County Jail where Charlie was serving up until he got transferred to a state prison northwestern um, Florida in the Panhandle area there, close to Pensacola. So he's even further away from his life down there in uh, South M Florida, Miami area. So the um, the thing is, what it really struck me was just the fact that he's denying any acceptance uh, of responsibility. He's not blaming anything he did. None of the choices that he made were, were um, his fault. It's all everybody else's fault. And uh, so I thought also he was uh, even misconstruing and misleading folks on on something is that was very obvious to me because I was actually there in the closing arguments with my brother, John. And uh, and so it's like, wow, that that's like so misleading. It's something that you guys want to see looking at the live stream on Tallahassee Democrat or wherever you're looking at it. But um, he, he was talking about the autopsy photos that Georgia was uh basically trying to inflame the jury by having the autopsy photos up there for five to 10 minutes. He keeps using the term five to 10 minutes. And uh, that is just so incorrect. Um, we were there and I, I could not look at the photos per se. I just took a quick glance at one and I sort of stared um, near the other photos in that one as well that I initially got a quick look at, but they were, I just did not want to go, um, look at them and so but i did pay attention to how long they were on the screen and they were on the screen a little longer than like 30 40 seconds and i talked to john about this he agreed as well so saying that they're on this up there on the uh, projector for five to ten minutes at a time is just completely false and um and it, it was totally appropriate what georgia had done there was nothing in bad taste there wasn't anything she was trying to do to to whip up the jury in a frenzy of anger of hatred about hey we got to ex extract you know, blood from somebody that uh, that's got to pay the price for this death and um, and not look at the evidence. So that was completely misleading and false what he's saying about that. Maybe he thought it was that long because uh, it lasted uh, too much in his mind. But keep this also in mind when he when the closing arguments was going on, there's several big screens around the jury and one of them is directly behind Georgia. And then Charlie, he also has a screen there. And right and directly in front of them, a pretty big screen, uh, d uh, laptop computer, and the screen's probably like uh, at least at least a 18 inch screen. His screen was completely shut off. He was just looking straight ahead at his computer screen. So I don't think the jurors could have seen that from their angle because they're totally at a 90 degree angle to the screen. So they wouldn't have seen that his screen actually wasn't presenting anything. So what was looking like, for, I was looking more of like a 45 degree angle with John, and it looked like. Um, you know, the jurors could not have seen the screen. Now, maybe the one on the end closest to us possibly could have uh, the juror in the front row to the right if you're facing the jury, but um, and maybe the person behind uh, her. But um, other than that, I mean, the jurors would not have picked up on the fact that he didn't have a screen before, before him to look at what George was actually presenting um, when she showed the autopsy photos and stuff like that. And I was looking for a reaction from him also as well. I, when I glanced over a couple of times, and uh, he was just looking straight ahead, just not even trying to look up and uh, pay any attention to those as well. So I thought that's another something that uh, a data point that the jurors would pick up on, that he's not even he's not even uh, affected by anything having to do with Dan Markell's murder. He doesn't seem to be shook up by the fact that his boy, uh, his nephews are uh, are without a father. There's just there's just total devoid of any emotion whatsoever. And you just can't you can't. Um, you can't fake it. And so whatever he was doing up there when he was on the, on the witness box testifying to ad nauseum going on and on and on. I mean, it was just so as we, as we, uh, if you've seen it, you've seen how painful it was to watch. It was just, he had an excuse for everything. It just, it was all, it came across as so manufactured fake and, and insincere and, and rehearsed as well. He had, you know, well over a year and a half to rehearse everything he was going to say. And, and write things out for his attorney to ask, and they would have had a chance to go over that and whatnot. So it just sounded so, so, um, so terribly uh, 
um, done that his credibility just was not there at all. And he never talks about anything about, wow, how could they convict an innocent man? He mentions innocent, I'm innocent once or twice, but it's just sort of like in, in passing, he mentions it, but he doesn't sound like an innocent man at all. And uh, an innocent man would be going like, I told the truth and they didn't, they should have believed me. How could, you know, and then you point the finger at other people that brought you down, not the fact that you don't have any evidence. So, well, there was a lot of evidence that brought him down. It wasn't just uh, some emails and texts as he complains about, but it's actually other testimony as well. And uh, we did have Katie, for example, talking about how he was uh, probing her to see if she knew anybody that could put some hurt on somebody. That was the end of October of 2013. So he was, he, she was totally groomed to find somebody to do this damage to uh, Dan Markell. It, it was so obvious. He wasn't into, he wasn't into um, women with children. There was nothing serious about it. And uh, she, she was played, she was played. And she also obviously played him um, to, to a large extent as well. But in the end, he, he knew from the get go exactly what she was needed for. And she, and she, uh, she met that, um, uh, met that requirement and that's why he stuck with her as long as he did. And, um, so anyway, I thought that, uh, I thought that was something that was, uh, out there that, that, uh, you may not be aware of on the autopsy photos. Um, something else he said, it was that Georgia had conned the jury. I heard him say that one time and that was like, wow, that was really a, a unfair dig on Georgia. Georgia didn't do anything to con anybody. She just laid the facts out there had those brilliant graphics uh, that rolled out the evidence and all, all the different details that are necessary to show how this family operated. They operated like a cult. They're very closely guarded in how they handled things. And they, uh, they did recruit Katie through, um, through the use of his, uh, this dating relationship, the so-called dating relationship with, uh, with Charlie to be able to, uh, find somebody that could be a hitman that they could have some kind of control and leverage over. Um, and also, um, and also yeah, giving them the opportunity to get more and more money as time went on. So, so they thought they had everything, the perfect plan murder that it would never have any backblast against them, but, uh, how, how definitely wrong that was. And so, um, Georgia did, did, uh, a, a phenomenal job, as I've said before on, on her closing, and she nailed, brought home all the different points and basically all the evidence that they had, a lot of it from Sergeant Corbett that was so professionally done with all those graphic slides to pull in all the phone data, show the locations of how the hitmen, for example, drove from South Miami all the way up to uh, Tallahassee and back and, and where they're at in Tallahassee and where were that when they're getting the rental car and what Katie was doing. I mean, that was a, such a phenomenal presentation. You couldn't ask for a better, better presentation. And um, so there was no conning at all. All that was facts. And keep in mind, the defense counsel, if the prosecutor is saying something that's not actually brought into evidence, then they can object and the judge will, will cite them for that and say, no, you stand corrected counsel. Um, um, and, and the judge will tell the, uh, the jury to disregard a statement that was not introduced in evidence. So are arguments evidence? No, but they do have to be truthful about what the evidence presented. And they obviously they can argue different interpretations of the evidence that was brought before them, but they just can't make up evidence out of thin air and, uh, and, and, and something that didn't happen in the trial through any witness or any uh, document or anything like that. They just can't start making stuff up in their closings. And that's what he's making it sound like Georgia did just picked a few things here and there and, 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 and tried to try to con the jury, like, like they're a bunch of dummies. Right. So yeah, look, that's something that also came up a lot. And uh, I know Donna mentioned that as well, saying they didn't have a brain, they're deaf, things like, like that was, were recurring themes as well. So they really are insulting this, this jury there of 12 that um, voted to convict Charlie in just a matter of a couple hours. So, But the reason being that was that it was such a slam dunk win. It wasn't the fact that they were uh, just trying to whip up a frenzy of hatred to these uh, South Miami rich people. So um, there, there was just nothing there was just nothing that Georgia did to taint anything. It was totally a professional, absolutely professional argument. Um, and then when he talks over and over about there's no evidence and he, and he says all he had was some texts and some emails and, and some calls that are taken out of context. Well, if they're taken out of context, what was the right context? Your lawyer is there. He's been working the case for a year and a half. If there's a different context than what the prosecutor's arguing, 
Well, then show the rest of the conversations. They had more of the conversations. A prosecutor is not going to bring up other parts of the conversations that were um, that weren't necessary to prove the point of how uh, guilty they were looking and sounding by by uh, taking these extracts of conversations out. So, to, and and if you recall, Rashbaum did do that a bunch of times, trying to describe other things that were happening going on, and it was really worthless and pointless, but. It looked like he was just trying to uh, do something to try to cause at least confusion and misunderstanding. And anyway, he was just so hard to follow. It was just really, it was just really, I thought, uh, poor accuracy. And uh, you want to have the jury be able to follow up on stuff. And he did show s some um, other slides, I recall, of things that George had brought up. He wanted to bring up a few extra things, but it wasn't even like in, in a context that would make any difference. So um, he was just spinning his wheels and he wasn't getting any traction, as I said. So. Uh, that was completely pointless. Um, also, keep in mind the, uh, you know, he never talks about how George had talked about how Jeff LaCasse was framed by uh, him him being pursued by by his sister, Wendy, Wendy Adelson, and then dumped him a few days before the actual murder was to take place and make him look like a jilted lover. And as I've said, it made it, she was trying to, what I think was, recruit him to actually be part of the, the hit team. Um, and maybe she trusted Jeff to do it more than some, uh, some, some knuckleheads that Charlie was able to uh, muster out of South Florida. So I think that's a real strong uh, likelihood there. And um, so another comment he said was that, uh, that one of the jailers had said to him or bailiff jailer or bailiff, one of the two, I forget which, was that he, he said something about unless you'd been living under a rock or um, for the last uh, 10 years, you'd be lying if you hadn't heard of the case. So he was angry about some of the jurors weren't forthcoming about it and uh, about what they knew about the case. But then he was also talking about, you know, a lot of people had listened to the, uh, you know, six hours worth of different podcasts and whatnot that talked about the murder of Dan Mark Hill. So, but that's not automatically going to exclude them. And a lot of the stuff was older, per se. We weren't a part, you know, part of the conversations at all, all the conversations that uh, the attorneys and, and the judge had with these jurors because they went in a, in a back room. And so they were not part of the normal uh, display of juror, juror questioning for the public uh, consumption there on uh, the live video feed. But um, from from the gist of it, um, the uh, the evidence was such that you would have a lot of people that could hear about a case. That's not unusual. Just because you hear about a case doesn't mean you're not able to sit on a jury. And a lot of the people's memories were sketchy or whatnot. Now, there was one person that they actually got kicked off, and that was defense counsel doing their job, which was, uh, I remember him saying something about so some juror that denied having any kind of social media, I think. And then, as it turns out, he they found out through this uh, uh, jury consulting crew that, the person actually said like four months previous that they wished Sigfredo Garcia, they could kill him or something to that effect. So um, Charlie was pretty amazed that that juror had actually lied, but they brought that guy back in for questioning and he got kicked off for, uh, for obviously not his uh, not having proper candor and honesty about it and have that kind of like pers being personally wrapped around the facts of the case and then claiming you don't have any. So, but that's how the system works. You don't always necessarily have uh, jurors that, uh, they're going to be honest and forthright that come in there. But the ones that actually wound up being selected, I mean, they they spent enough time probing and prodding and, and trying to find out what, what are their true beliefs and opinions? Are they able to keep an open mind? Is there any beliefs that Charlie does not presume innocent and that the government has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt or they have an absolute duty to vote not guilty? So um, the jurors, all of them were employed type of people. They all had families. They're all parents. Um there was even comments Charlie made about um, that the um, some of the jurors that the um, that they all the what did he say successful high let me go to that my notes here educated and successful people got stricken really so there, there's educated people on that panel definitely and maybe they didn't have the education level that Charlie had but they were definitely. Uh, people that were uh, good, honest, hardworking Americans. And uh, for him to say they weren't um, educated and successful, really. So um, that was just so insulting. And it was, uh, it was, 
something to show that they just thought they could go in there and uh, just mop up the courtroom, take these knuckleheads on, on the uh, on the Hick juries there in Tallahassee and just bamboozle them with flash and and have these high powered lawyers coming in from New York and Miami and just basically just trick them into at worst getting a hung jury. So um, it was just it's just really bizarre to hear all this kind of stuff. And uh, and then Charlie also says. If he had any idea that they could turn this into emails with no context or um, to any of the uh, to any of these emails, um, you know, he would have he would have reacted differently. And he would he talked about Georgia was twisting the truth and all that kind of stuff. And it was, again, so far fetched. It was the only one twisting the truth and talking lies was Charlie. And uh, everything that Georgia did did have proper context. It was just that what defense did, they didn't have proper context. They didn't make any sense. They, they made complete ridiculous uh, theory of this double extortion. So then there was also some conversation that the only difference is Dan said that we had a chance and he said that we were going to get a fair jury. So he made it sound like Daniel Rashbaum did not realize that they're going to walk up there into Tallahassee courtroom and get such a terrible jury. And he talked about them being like the, the worst, the worst got removed, but they're all still bad for him. So the, um, it, it made it look like his, 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 um, his lawyers were telling him he had a great shot and he should have won and he will win. And all of a sudden the publicity supposedly changed it. That's what Donna said. Yeah, there's a publicity that changed it. So, no, the publicity didn't change it because if somebody had too much uh, publicity knowledge about the case and if they um, had a fixed opinion based on it and they're an avid follower of the case on social media or wherever, then then they would have not have been sitting on the case. Um, so it, it was ones that were um, just casually aware. Those are the kinds of people that, uh, from my experience and uh, whatnot, those are the kind of people that could be uh, seated on a case. And I'm sure they were the ones here. And uh, another thing I thought was really odd was that Charlie was talking about how Rashbaum told him that if he's got a 70 when he's testifying, then he can drive him home. And I've never heard another attorney talk about scoring how a, how a defendant testifies or any witness for that matter. But scoring it like by numerics is really, to me, really odd because um what happens, especially as a defendant testifying in, in his own defense and something as serious as a murder case going on, you have to have like impeccable, impeccable credibility. You cannot get tripped up on a single little thing. One little thing you say wrong, or even if you say everything honest to God, the truth, let's say, but you come across the wrong way, you come across sort of like an elitist snob type of person or you come across and, and just have a, a, a glib attitude and a flippant attitude towards a prosecutor. And you're using like the F word and freely in front of the jury and stuff like that. I mean, just like a lot of cringe type of things I saw as an attorney that, I mean, you don't, you don't put a numeric score on that. One little thing can make a jury be turned off by you and think, you know what? This guy did it. He really did it. And you may have a case where like, you may have a case where a guy is completely innocent and the jury just doesn't believe him because something he says is, is not done, said the right way, or maybe he's misspoke accidentally um, or whatnot. So it's very easy. It's very easy, even if you have a truthful defendant, to get tripped up on something if they're not adequately prepared and think about words that they say. If they're, if they're too fast for their words, they got a quick answer for everything. Those are the kind of people that jurors, I, from my experience, they really – they really are more have a cynical eye and, and uh, more of a level of distrust. So, um, and think about it, Harvey, uh, excuse me, Charlie was the last one to testify. So he got, he got a chance to address anything any other witness said, and he knew what every other witness has said to that point. He didn't know what, what a rebuttal witness would say, right? But, and there was not a rebuttal witness call. So he was the last one that got to finish up and address any um, things that they thought that they were um, needing to address for the prosecution's case and what was wrong and whatnot. And so anyway, the um, Dan had also said that um, I can get you the finish line um, after he said that about the uh, scoring a 70 on his testimony. And then, and then after he got done testifying, so that was on a Friday afternoon, 
And uh, he told him, you know, according to this is according to obviously Charlie, he's saying that Daniel Rashbaum told him he scored a 95 on his testimony. And that was if that was if that was really the case. I'm like, wow, that is like so far off from what I've seen. And for those of you that may recall, when he testified on that Thursday, he was on direct examination the entire day. And so it was so boring and it was so um, painful to watch. People were just clearing out of the courtroom. I mean, a lot of people left before noon and then afternoon. It just like most people didn't come back. It was just that painful to watch. So how would an attorney not know that the courtroom's cleared out when you got your star client on the stand saying how he's innocent and people don't even want to listen to it? So it just really makes you wonder. It's like, what what were they looking at? Was was uh, was Rashbaum completely oblivious to what was going on behind him there in the courtroom? And so anyway, it was uh, it was I thought just so so bizarre that you score your client a 95 and stuff like that. And um, and anyway, I was um, I was just not impressed with uh, how he testified at all. I thought he completely lied. It was all just a mo it, it's like I say, the worst offense I have ever seen in any serious case at all. I mean, this is like so far out there removed from and just absolutely crazy that you had no chance at all and i know actually that um somebody mentioned this to me thank you for your email that um that this defense theory supposedly came out on the, the um wondery site over my dead body and i think the guy's name's matt matt Shear or something like that but um he said that maybe that was a possibility that he could say that you know it's uh katie and, and her boyfriend that tried to extort him or something like that and he just sort of threw it out there maybe that could be possible plausible but it sounds so far-fetched but i don't know maybe maybe the the whole thing is as um as it th this maybe came from matt this whole thing for uh charlie uh came from matt and uh didn't come from charlie before he met with his attorney so um but like i say it's just it was just so so outside of uh the realm of possibility it was absolutely ludicrous and so that that's that guaranteed a conviction so his own defense theory guaranteed a conviction and uh and when you have a defendant testify on the stand um the government could have a weak case let's say maybe the the jury's thinking yeah we don't we don't think the government's proven their case beyond reasonable doubt when you put that defendant up on the stand jurors will come to every kind of conclusion they need to to make the right one and everything that when you got a defendant on the stand for that many hours and then think about it he also got on the stand for like an hour and a half on friday morning and then george across him for about two hours roughly as i recall and so he was on the stand for like a day and a half and uh during that day and a half i mean the jury can just pick up on so much and if he just says one thing that they don't like and they go you know what? i don't trust this guy he's not credible he comes across is like too slick and too rehearsed. That's game over for for uh, most defendants. That's going to be game over, and so that's the high risk you take as as a defendant when you get on the witness stand, especially for that many hours. Then uh, you're looking at a whole lot of you're looking at a whole lot of backblast potential if you say one thing wrong or you come across the the, the wrong way to to the jury. And so, um, in any event, I, I thought that was. Uh, that was very uh very telling there the fact that uh the the uh the witnesses are basically filing out of the the um the courtroom not the witnesses but the the spectators are uh, filing out of the courtroom they just got so tired of listening to this uh non-stop gibberish of uh charlie that they couldn't take it anymore and yet yet he scored a 95 and Rashbaum also said the jury consultants uh not there in the courtroom but they had viewed it online as well and they were also impressed with him so i was like wow um okay um didn't fool the jurors though did they and then um yeah as, as somebody commented here that uh tonight he never once blames the extortioners of uh how how they lied they didn't uh they didn't they weren't they were not credible and that they had set him up. He never blames himself for uh, agreeing to the extortion plan. And, and why wouldn't they believe him when this is what really happened? It's, it's almost like that was his part of the rig story. What you say just, just to concoct some kind of uh, uh, a fast and loose story about 
you're just going to throw it up on the wall, see what sticks and you expect the jury to, to uh, believe it. So, um, and then he also says something where um, Charlie's saying that, you know, he's uh, harping a lot about Wendy too. And he's talking about how, you know, think about it. I'm, she comes in here and they're thinking about the case. I'm smarter than you. I'm richer than you. I'm better than you. And then you followed up with these autopsy photos and, he basically make it, made it sound like it was all about some kind of like class warfare, like the rich versus the poor kind of thing. And, um, and then he calls it BS fluff. And um, and then he also talks about he brings up one of the jurors that said he had a was making 12 bucks an hour at the FSU bookstore. And for him to then hear about think, and then he's saying, you think he wants to hear about how uh, Wendy is uh I'll use the word crapping on Tallahassee. And uh, so he made it sound like they, they all took it personal the way Wendy came across. He never took any responsibility for himself. And then um, and then they talk about him and his mom is talking about this isn't like what Daniel Roshbaum had uh, said about the jury. So how, how would you not know the jury's going to know about this from the pretrial publicity? It sounds like several times they talk about how they didn't they weren't taken into account that you know, there are a lot of um, following this channel, um, excuse me, this this case. And uh, think about all the new channels that are covering the case now. And a lot of them are covering Wendy. So many channels now are popping out of nowhere and talk about Wendy's involvement and stuff like that. So um, if they thought it was bad before, it's really getting, the pressure's really get building and building now to get the remaining Adelsons. And um, and the other thing I thought um, was was striking to me was so if you track what he's saying uh, and if you believe what he's saying about what he's being told by counsel, he's saying basically the case was one. He said he basically had a good uh, weekend uh, before the closing arguments because, uh, you know, he scored a 95. You only need to score to 70 on his testimony. And so he gave away his stuff that Monday. He gave away his food and the other uh, commissary type things he had. He gave them away to his uh, fellow inmates. And uh, cause he was going home. In fact, he was like, well, I, I can just leave from the courtroom with my attorney. I don't need to come back here. So in doing that, um, what happened then? Why, why, why did all of a sudden something turn for the worse? What was, what was, uh, what would change that outcome? The mere closing argument of Georgia Kaplan could go from uh, snatch the, uh, you know, the, uh, the victory out of their hands and uh flip the script and, and make that a conviction for charlie so no it's it wasn't that at all granted it was an awesome closing she drilled home all the points of those awesome graphic things as i've said but she did not snatch a loss out of that case and and make it perfected with a closing argument so she did not need a perfect closing argument she had one but and like i said on her uh, cross-examination on on charlie it was not a textbook like gotcha moment where she just raked him over the coals. No, but it wasn't needed to be that kind of a cross examination. Just let Charlie can take control, let him have a glib answer, a slick answer for everything. And and that's all you need as a, as a prosecutor. So Charlie did his own damage and uh, Georgia had some good points in there. And it was enough to uh, it was enough to secure the conviction. Georgia wouldn't even have to argue. That's how obvious this thing was. And when I sat in there and looked at the uh, jurors and, and the argument, listening to the arguments and stuff like that, um, they were totally glued into what Georgia was saying. And uh, they, they had a lot of options to look at the slides as well. And, and they're doing both. And uh, the, the slides were very, very compelling. And uh, but they were talking about evidence. It wasn't it wasn't manufactured. Um, um, uh, things that were uh, could be labeled as. Uh, spins of truth like charlie's saying and whatnot it's, it's absolute truth and was, a lot of it was the actual words and actions of of the adelsons and their co-conspirators so um great job and i just thought that was really bizarre how they think that they could they could go from an absolute slam dunk win to losing just because of uh george's closing that had that what charlie keeps talking about is the uh two-hour dateline special so um sorry charlie that's not that's not the only thing that convicted you with some sensationalized um presentation that wasn't based on facts that were brought out before trial so that's the way it's done in america you bring forth those kind of facts and little minutiae of details 
and the, the devil's in the details and that's how you get get the convictions and wins as a prosecutor and it's also how you get uh acquittals as, as a defense attorney so um she just had the better uh, knowledge of the facts and the evidence was on her side because he was found guilty guilty as he should have been because he was um guilty of that and he also mentions charlie also mentions that uh that it wasn't the jury but the whole panel and he goes it wasn't just one person that um there wasn't a single person that voted for me not one so it sounds like he's like they're supposed to vote for me well really charlie this they're voting based on the evidence presented so it's not like you're voting for you or versus for georgia or a for the Mark Hills versus you, they're looking at, they're doing their job and they're looking at totally based on the evidence. So it just looked like he was thought it was all about him and, and not about the evidence. And, um, and like I say, I think he, he's saying he was led to believe this was a slam dunk win from the get go. There was no evidence against him. He's going to walk out of there. But then he's also talking about how he, he should have listened to his gut. Well, what was his gut? And he mentioned his gut in 2020, his gut in 2020, I think was telling him, leave the country now. We even heard Ryan Fitzpatrick telling him, it's like, dude, why are you going back to the United States? You know, you know, you could get busted there. He, and he was like, he talked himself out of it at that point. So, um, but he did say multiple times that, you know, his advisors told him that he's going to be fine. He's got nothing to worry about. You know, he's got all this millions of dollars at his disposal to hire the best defense team money can buy. He, he wasn't going to worry about it. He wanted to stay in America. And that was, that was the end of it at that point. But, once he got convicted, all that came flashing back to him. And um, think about it. He, the my, many times he's mentioning Wendy. So he's mentioning Wendy in the context of driving Bon Trescott. He, he cannot get over the fact that she drove on Trescott. He even mentioned that friend of his from Detroit that said, what, what, what are the odds that Wendy would drive down there like an hour after the murder? And Charlie is saying, it's like, yeah, it does seem odd. He goes, like, dude, that's one in a million that 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 would happen you can't tell me you know if you're sitting in a bar talking to somebody they're going to tell you she, the only reason she went down there is because she was involved so those are the kind of things he was saying to his mom and uh they're basically almost even it sounded like they were mocking wendy for even denying that she was on trust god and even donna said yeah she was she was there or something like that so um and then you also talk about how the book he was really angry about the book and I think he had no idea how that book would come into play. I, I think uh, he's making it sound like if he knew the book and the trust cut issue were going to be so much in play, as well as this TV code thing that he in 2020, he would have like fled the country, and never returned. And if you stop to think about it, there over there in Vietnam, where my brother's John had been a couple of times, there's a lot of expats there. It's a very modern city. They have great food. Um, they have a lot of uh, modern conveniences. They have a lot of factories there now. There's a lot of uh, Chinese corporations that are building uh, things there as well or manufacturing things there. And um, so it's a, a very modernized city. But what it doesn't have is the high cost. And so um, I was just talking to John today, and he said, like, you can have a, a live-in professional um a housekeeper, maid, cook, all that kind of stuff for just $600 a month. And they'd live there Monday through Friday. You give them weekends off and they'd have free room and board there. But uh, basically for just $600 a month. And then you can get like a brand new uh, two bedroom, really nice, fancy high rise condo apartment type thing for only $1,200 a month and have a rooftop pool. And I mean, just complete luxury type of thing. And so for, for basically that, um, $1,800 a month, you'd have, you'd have to buy food and some other things. But I mean, you can really live like a king uh, on a lot less than what you can most places in the world and uh, including the United States. So um, anyway, the um, so I, I think and what he most obviously doing was taking a, a recon tour to see where his family could escape to. So I think if Charlie would have, would have been over there and then they knew Katie got arrested and stuff like that, they they pretty much all could have fled and uh, and had a very well life. And um, as John said, it's like you pay to play over there. And if you got, if you can grease politics, politicians and uh, people in authority with money, uh, line their pockets, stuff like that, you'll be protected. So he, he maybe would never been extradited back, uh, no matter what kind of pressure the government could put on. He could open his own, uh, periodontal clinic there and, 
um, changed his name, came up with a Korean, maybe he could have come up with a Korean first name and last name and established a, a medical practice there and um, and done really well for himself. And especially seeing all these, uh, you know, expats and other folks that are moving there. In fact, one, one of the subscribers to this who may be on the show right now, he's, he might be, um, <coughs> excuse me, he might be um, moving over there in the next few months. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still trying to get over some bronchitis I've been fighting here the last week. And um, in any event, so it's uh, it's definitely a place they could have blended in. It wouldn't have been like they're outcasts and wouldn't have been able to adopt to that kind of environment. So in any event, um, yeah, some other uh, last couple of things I haven't jotted down here was that he mentioned again, you know, if he would have thought it came down to the crazy emails, the Wendy book and the drive up the crime scene. So it sounds to me like, you know, he's really blaming his mom for the crazy emails and then he's and, and then Wendy for what she did. And it sounds to me like he's so mad at himself because those were things he did, wasn't aware of. Think about all the planning they would have done as a family to commit this murder and those are things that they would have not he would not have been in uh aware have any awareness of do you think mom mom didn't cc charlie on that you think she she forwarded that to him after the facts he didn't know he didn't know that kind of hate was in any kind of like digital trail that could follow back to them and um and then obviously the thing about wendy in the book i mean he was going on and on about that book and you know, trying to say it wasn't Tallahassee, but even sounds like Tallahassee with the Hiawassee. And then um, additionally, the, uh, you know, the, the, the name of the college is almost the exact same. It just says Northern Florida State University. And he, he also mentioned that, you know, the guy in the book had uh, um, uh, was married with two kids to this gal that's supposed to be um, Wendy, the, the, um, the one that she lied about in court and said it was uh it was the book is written about a friend of hers not herself but yet in the acknowledgments of the book she said this book is largely based on her own life so um in any event i, I just thought that was uh that that's the reason why he keeps going over and over again about how angry he is about the things he wasn't aware of in, the, in their in their murder planning is that that donna had these nasty hitler youth type of uh emails talking about talking to wendy about having the boys change uh, do a mock change of their face, change them to Catholics and have them go to mass and get confirmed and all that kind of stuff, baptized or whatever it was. I, I forget those details, but, um, and then just to do stuff to just incite Dan in, into just capitulating and saying, okay, fine, you can have the kids in Miami. And uh, so, and then the, um, um, the fact that she went down Prescott, I mean, that is, just, that is so damning. I mean, that's, that's what I say is, 1A for the most damning evidence against Wendy. And then he ties it into being like, well, if you think that Wendy showed up there and it wasn't a coincidence, then then that means she was in on it. And if she was in, if she was in on it, then that means I was in on it. So he really follows the logic trail of how Georgia can use this and her prosecution to show that they're all involved as a family. Um, especially Wendy and uh and Donna and Charlie. So this is this is why it's I think it's very much helpful to the uh, prosecution to listen to these tapes because it, it does sound incriminating. And um, and the context isn't just the fact that Georgia argued this. He's actually embellishing what Georgia said and, and actually driving home the points even more. And um, by doing so, he's using words like uh, crazy and creepy to describe Wendy's behavior. So that's not something that uh, that I recall Georgia saying. And so he's 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 actually adding to her arguments that she could use in the next upcoming trial against Donna. So I thought that was very uh, telling. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it now over to questions. So uh, if you do have questions here, I'm looking for uh, the triple Q. Hopefully, if you can put it in red, I don't know how to do, put it in red, but if you can put them in red. Um,
All right, so this looks, uh, I'm, I'll see a question. Yeah, a lot. I think I'm still in the intro part. Yeah, th I started this, and I guess the comments, you guys can talk among yourselves for several hours before uh, before um, I came on here. So here the gardener says, I was flabbergasted by Charlie's deeply condescending remarks about the jury. Have you found anything in the tapes that might help in getting Wendy's case before the grand jury? Yeah, I think I've just talked about that. I think he, he brings home the point of, what are the odds Wendy's going to drive by there? What are the odds that Wendy writes a book talking about how she's basically planning to leave Tallahassee? And uh, and then he has a graphic term describe what uh, he said she was doing to Tallahassee as she left town. So, yeah, I mean, it was it's like really it's really um, it's really, I think, good to hear a convicted murderer talk about his sister that way. And then driving down Trescott, he also called it like one in 10,000 chance that she would drive down there and how bad it looks. And then you combine that also with the TV code that she's mentioning the TV code a couple of times that morning. I think he had no idea she was saying that as well. So I think all the things that he lost control of in planning this thing, I think that's that's why he's so angry about it. And I think he really pins it on Wendy is the reason why he got convicted. As much as he says anything about the jury and stuff like that, I think it's just really eating on him. And I think this is a prelude to him maybe wanting to flip on Wendy. But I think they got enough on evidence on, against Wendy. I don't think they need to use him. So um, it remains to be seen what the state attorney's office decides to do and what they how they value it. But Roger W. says, uh, I can't believe Chucky is so delusional and so arrogant. Yeah, I mean, that's just sort of his M.O. I mean, he was, he's sort of been that way. He's uh, very, very he, he's a maestro, right? And that's the maestro wasn't even something that the prosecutors brought up. I was, I was surprised by that. And I think the maestro really would have drove home the point that this guy, this guy's all about, you know, taking taking ownership of whatever, whatever kind of environment he's in. He's not going to let somebody else tell him what to do. Okay, looking for the red, still scrolling down, trying to go a little bit faster here. Sorry to hold you guys up. I'm going to work it where I can have some folks that I can put the questions for me, so I'm not taking your time. I like to be as efficient as possible. And oh, by the way, um, I don't think I mentioned this. Forgive me if I have, but uh, I appreciate John getting me this new camera. This new camera has internal cooling fans, and so that was the problem on the other ones. They were overheating which absolutely sounds crazy. It's like, how would a camera overheat after 15 minutes or so? But um, in any event, um, thank you, John, for this great Sony FX30, which has not had any overheating problems since I've been using it. I think it's the third time I've used it now. So um, thanks so much, John. Looks like some internal chat right here. Oh, 806. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to start going into, uh, I think I start about 806, so... Roger W. saying, when do you think Wendy will be arrested, Carl? Well, I, th I think that uh, the sooner the better, but if they're going to want to use her to testify against mom, then they probably don't want her uh, arrested beforehand, although they could do that. I don't, I don't know any reason why they couldn't have her uh, testify uh, before uh, as uh, somebody that's uh, indicted and awaiting trial, just like her mom, ha have her testify just like she has before, but have her come out of the Leon County Jail to do so. But they're probably not doing that. But maybe they'll usher it up sooner if uh, if they get wind that she's going to flee the country like her parents tried to. Georgia girl saying that Jeff Lacoste mentioned in an interview with Detective Isom that Wendy told him that Wendy's dad had a history of violence when Jeff asked her about it again. She denied it. Um, yeah, I, I remember something about that. I don't, I don't remember about Jeff asking her about it again, but I remember something about that coming up and like, he was a guy that was scary to deal with. And I think Jeff did say like, he was like the one that had the worst temper of, of the whole group. And so he could be scary.
Um, here's a question. Uh, SD is asking, do I think that Harvey is suffering it now uh, all alone? Well, I think he might be somewhat with Donna, excuse me, with um, Wendy at this point. Not sure. But yeah, if he's up alone in that high rise by himself, it would be very, uh, very much alone. And, you know, the other thing is, I mentioned this before, but them popping all those pills and Charlie always tell them, tell them to take Xanax. That's just not, that's not a good thing. And uh, you can get very, very addicted to those kind of things. They can really mess up your brain on a permanent basis. And, um, and there's things I think they call like taper withdrawal syndrome. And you just cannot get off these things without these kind of drugs. It's extremely um, putting you through, through the, the unbelievable bond of hell um, mentally and physically to come off of them. Okay, SP74 uh, says, uh, how do I think the case against Donna will differ from Charlie's? Well, I think that they really could present the exact same kind of evidence they had before. I think they may use a few different wiretaps, additional wiretaps that they didn't have before to present against Charlie. But the um, definitely the ones involving anything involving Donna on the wiretaps and whatnot would be presented. The same kind of stuff about the, um, you know, the, the, uh, all the chatter and code and all that kind of stuff that's going on on the wiretaps and also the email and text, all that kind of same stuff is going to be presented. And that's why I thought it would have been perfect to have Donna sitting there as a co-defendant and Wendy as well um, for Charlie's trial and uh, as well as Harvey. So you just would have had to tailor the evidence a little bit for uh, Wendy and Harvey, but that would have been enough to convict all four. And here Sumi's asking is, um, uh, Will investigators be able to monitor Harvey and Wendy's interaction after Donna's arrest to collect more evidence? They may have some kind of tabs on them. I don't know how close it would be. Law enforcement, you know, it's Tallahassee Police Department. So I don't think they're going to send somebody down to Miami to look at it. Then you talk about a different um, authority down there with the you know, with the sheriffs down there. They're, how interested are they going to be help, helping folks up in Tallahassee? FBI, they're probably too engaged in uh, other stuff to, to be following that close. But I, I, they may have some some tabs on them. And uh, they may have some informants, too. I mean, there's folks that came forward and ratted out Harvey and uh, Donna for trying to flee. So I I, I would expect that to continue. I, I think that they don't have any single person they can trust other than the lawyers to not say something that shouldn't be repeated. And uh, so here's a good question from Lena asking, is Donna still in protective custody? That's my understanding. Um, I got some contacts down in the local area there and um they're they're telling me their understanding is that donna is uh definitely still in protective custody well it's not protective custody in that sense it's um it's called suicide it's basically the suicide watch cell protective custody is more you're trying to protect uh an inmate from other inmates um not not the issue of suicide but it, to the extent it's interchangeable in different states that's a possibility but um, but I, I call it the suicide watch cell. So yeah, she's there with lights on 24 seven, just has a thin, uh, basically paper type of a uh, frock that she has for, um, attire. And she, I saw that she's complaining about not having, uh, um, warmer food and she's complaining about not getting to use her spoon for a longer period of time and stuff like that. So she's trying to file a number of grievances. So, um, don't know much more beyond that, but Kevin Hornbuckle saying there was another trial in which the, aim, the murderer tried to reverse engineer a preposterous tale for the jury who was convicted. Yeah, I mean, when you start going down this this absolute extreme outrageous type of story and you got a slick answer for everything. Um, yeah, that's that's. Uh, Julian Nelson saying when you've caused the autopsy picks, I'm sure a small amount of time is disturbingly long. Yeah. And like I say, he wasn't even looking at him. I mean, he wasn't, he was he had zero emotion from what I could tell looking at him, like from a 45 and uh and uh, maybe maybe 10 feet further behind him and across the other side of the uh courtroom. Oh, Dr. Martina saying, uh, hello from Prague. Wait until 3 a.m. for your Prague. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you're still on here, um, but.
Yeah, Peachy Stay uh Stacy says he never once in a call claims he's in. He did mention it. Well, I'm innocent. He said it real casually once or twice, but it was just it wasn't even convincing. And he just like I said, said it to be uh saying it in passing. He was never he was never like in a shock, like, I can't believe that they don't believe me. This is what happened. How can these people not believe me? That's normally what a client's gonna say. Um, from my experience, if so, if um if somebody just doesn't believe somebody and something turns out bad, but anyway, I've I've just um like I say, I've never seen a worse defense theory than the, than this one here. And this is on a murder case. So uh Yank Canick says, wouldn't it have been better to have Wendy and Donna try to go to the same trial? Yeah, you know, that's something that I know um Stephen Webster, the attorney there for um for uh daniel markell he said that the pressure is really dialing up or where's that effect that he thinks that wendy's going to be arrested really soon and uh coming weeks and uh so i think that um i think that that's too too premature i think in my mind but um i think it's going to take longer than that but i think um i think trying all the rest of adelson's together is the best thing although the one advantage is if you do it in a serial order like this, you do get the jailhouse calls. But I think once you once you arrest Wendy, she's not going to be talking to anybody. And Wendy's nobody's calling Wendy, right? So Charlie's not talking to Wendy, and uh, Donna's not she Donna's not going to get through to Wendy at all. Um, so the only person that um, Donna has to call right now as a family member is actually Harvey and Harvey's even hanging up on her sometimes we're rejecting calls. So I was wondering if that's more or less because he's with Wendy and Wendy's the one, doing the one hanging up. But I, I don't think Donna, if you stop thinking about it, I don't think Donna is ever going to talk to Wendy again, period. And I think the only face to face interaction they'll have is when she's testifying against Donna. So unless they, unless you, they have her sitting at council table and they can chit chat, with each other then i mean that would, that would be worth it but um i think that um i think that she'll never have a personal call with wendy ever again and i don't think she'll ever have one with charlie again so unless they they're able to play a recording through their attorney for the other uh you know to be played and when they're meeting with their client or something like that then um so be it but um and here's uh roberta glass Nice to see you. And uh, she s says that uh, Charlie doesn't want the autopsy photos to be taken away f from his fake victimhood. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, it's, it's all fakery. Nothing sincere. There's nothing sincere or genuine about the way he came across whatsoever. So Sonny M is saying, I'm, I think it's so disgusting when Charlie is sobbing about his life is over. And even then, Donna doesn't recognize that all this started with her. Yeah, well, I think um, I think Wendy was the one that uh, initially kept on poisoning the well with her mom. I mean, why would she keep stirring up her mom like that? And uh, it, because she was so obviously involved in this as well, they tried to insulate her the best they could, but she still had too much of her... Um, her uh knowledge and she had to give him details for example when when was dan going to be there she wanted to know if he was going to be there the 17th to the 18th um because that's when the hit was probably going to go down most likely so she asked about the 16th but she really wanted to know about the 17th and 18th and as somebody pointed out in a in a comment today on my lot from my last live i was looking at and they said like why would she ask him that if he's going to be in town or not because if uh, according to the uh, marital uh, custody agreement that they had both agreed to, if he was out of town, it was her. Um, if he was out of town when the time he was supposed to have the boys, then she uh, he automatically has to offer it up to her. So why would she want to know what he's doing on a Wednesday when it's his time? And if it's not his time, then then she'd get him anyway. And so anyway, it's just it's just uh, however however the the details of that. I may I may be misspeaking that somewhat, but. Whatever the details of that were, I totally agree with that. You know, they had a they had a support agreement in place, and um, you know, Dan was doing going by the book on this thing. He wasn't doing anything to jerk around on visitation, and the thing it did have a, a requirement to have first right of refusal, and she was not giving that to Dan, but Dan was always giving it to her. So imagine how frustrated Dan would have been.
yeah happy new year thanks you guys happy new year um Yeah, Turquoise Kitten is saying they're all used to talking their way out of everything. Yeah, I mean, that's what they thought. With money, they can buy their way out of everything. It's always worked every time else in their life. This is the one time now it's not going to work in their own words. Or they're going to convict them, and they have convicted them so far. Yeah, Jennifer Ray is like, if I was innocent, he would be begging his mom to hire an investigator to find evidence of the truth, the whole family's guilty. Yeah, I mean, they didn't, I mean, they're basically saying the truth was, though, that the uh, that they were ex double extorted and that kind of stuff. But um, that's just so, so, so ridiculous that um, I don't know how you really investigate that part of it. But, um, you know, what I, what I would have uh, probed more as a prosecutor, just off the top of my head, I'm saying this. On this whole theory about the, the uh, extortion um, that Katie relayed through, um, that Sigfredo had relayed through Katie, it's like, I mean, does anybody stop? If you stop to think about it, okay, what would a normal person do? Somebody comes in the house and says, "Hey, look, you know, um, we killed so and so, uh, and that's that's your uh, that's your nephew's dad, and they want they want a hundred or they want a third of a million dollars. Otherwise, they're going to kill you too." <coughs> excuse me the first thing you're going to do <coughs> is either call the police or try to re re have them restate that and you're going to get it on recording or something <coughs> excuse me and you're not going to you're not going to you're not going to give that up and then we have a trail of you paying somebody I and mean, that's the worst thing you do pay the killers so that's what his defense was. I actually paid the killers, but I did it because I was forced to. <laughs> anyway, it's just so ludicrous. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> yeah, Charlie thought he was a major player in some kind of Miami Vice version. Yeah, it, it really seems that way. Yeah, hey Mona, I agree with that. <laughs> the con man calling a talented prosecutor a con laughable. Yeah. <laughs> you know, juries can, are good at sizing up credibility of witnesses, and he has zero credibility. And so um there's no way, there's no way. When I when I saw that um from here, I wasn't in Tallahassee yet, but I'm like it's he's done he's done for sticking a fork in it and everything i thought would happen about him going up in flames on the witness stand happened <laughs> so easily <coughs> to predict yeah he says that common sense y'all chucky says common sense y'all he sounds so arrogant yeah i mean it's just, he's mocking georgia and you know georgia Georgia wasn't trying to put on some kind of fake accent and it's not all folksy like that. She was just being herself. And, and so she wasn't trying to lay it on like that and act, act phony. Hi from Queensland, Australia. I have a heat wave down there. Lisa Cox. <coughs> I was asking, do you think Katie's giving up more on Wendy? I think that um, maybe she will, but I, I think she's still holding back. I think she's worried about Sigfredo. I think she's still thinking that there's going to be maybe some benefit to get some kind of extra money from Adelson's or whatnot because she's not totally spilling the spilling the beans on everything that's going on, has gone on in the past. So, so yeah, I think... Um, I think she may get better over time. I, I just don't know, but she, it's just really weird. The fact that Sinfredo hasn't rolled over, just extremely strange and bizarre, extremely bizarre. And the way Katie hasn't, I mean, those those guys are just really, um, I, I, I just, they, that, those gotta be like the dumbest decision makers ever, especially with Katie getting, being able to walk out of jail and uh, get time served. If she would have just rolled over and spoke the truth and she didn't. 
Zenos so performance says Wendy indicated she was going to change her and her children's names one day and suspect she will flee. Yeah. Um, yeah, if she flees the country, I'd think she will. Otherwise, she's going to keep the name Adelson. <clears throat> uh, Shaquille Oatmeal says, George was a great, is a great prosecutor, but a cross exam with him was quite disappointing. Well, like I say, yeah, it's, it's disappointing uh, in some respects, but like I say, you don't need to have those kind of gotcha moments, rake him over the coal. Just let the guy talk. He showed himself as a maestro. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, for example, when he said, I wish my mom would use the word TV code as code, what was she referring to? Why would she even mention that? I mean, you could have just gone on and on and just really drill down on that. But, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't necessary because the, he did the damage to himself, so. New York Patriot lady says, Carl, do you think it'd be a good idea to drive where Wendy drove and to make the K for kill turn? <laughs> Made the K for kill turn. Yeah, um, actually, because um, um, John and I were taken on that route, the um, on Trescott, and it's so obvious, so obvious that uh, that she was there for a uh, for a crime scene inspection. And I would say, if the prosecutors, when they're prosecuting, um, Wendy, if they don't have the jury show up there, just like they did for the murder case, they have the jury show up at the crime scene. They need to have the jury take the entire loop around from where she lived on Aqua Ridge and Northern uh, Tallahassee, take it the route all the way down Centerville Road. And then when she turned on Trescott, showing all the trees and the curves in the road, and uh, there's only sidewalk on one side, and the roads are narrow, and the curb is there. There's not even any parking. And um, it's just like the last kind of the last kind of drive you would ever want to take uh, as a shortcut. So um, and it wasn't a shortcut. And she drove like 40 some minutes out of the way. So uh, 20 some minutes to get down there roughly and then 20 minutes to go back up to the lunch place. And uh, her lunch was right next to multiple liquor stores. So, yeah, that's. Uh, um, so, yeah, not so much as important as you as the jury, the jury definitely if, if the jury sees that. There's no doubt in my mind. You, you'll get a slam dunk when you, they'll come out in just uh, you know two hours like they did for Charlie. Harley D is asking any idea on Donna's case management is. I think it's the 9th of January. So it was going to be later, as you recall, but uh, Descalzo asked for one early in January. And she talked about, um, she didn't use the word speedy trial, but she mentions something like, uh, quicker or, or urgent or something like that, indicating um, they wanted to move st stuff up on the timeline. Tennis Girl 101 says, Charlie blamed everything except himself and his attorney. Yeah, I mean, he he sort of blamed his mom, right? The crazy email. Um, and uh, but yeah, he doesn't blame himself and his attorneys, you know, they just got bamboozled up there. They had, had apparently had no idea that this, uh, that this, uh, all this kind of media coverage was out there. They would have had no clue, right? All right, so Roger W. again is asking uh, if Charles flips on Wendy, can you get resent? They, they may not reduce it. I mean, theoretically, you possibly could, depending on what weight he puts on and what corroboration, but um he may want to and then be to say sorry we don't need you i mean that would be how poetic would that be yeah sore throat is saying i was surprised to hear how many relatives friends and neighbors thought charlie did a great job yeah i mean just like i mean who knows if they even watched the whole thing maybe just told him he did great or whatever and maybe just tuned it out and didn't even follow it because they all maybe figured he was guilty except for mom and dad i mean why weren't any mom and dad there in the courtroom that is such a such a bad thing um, for jurors to pick up on. You don't have a single family member in the courtroom. That it's like on a murder case. Never seen something like that before. That is just so bizarre. That just showed consciousness of guilt. They didn't want to be in that county because they were worried about being arrested as they rightfully should have been. So it's not something innocent people do.
Uh, Zeno's performance is saying Rajpal was rude and distracting her in prosecution's closing statement, laughing and mocking. You know, yeah, he was doing some talking forth and back with Charlie. Whis I mean, he was whispering, and uh, but I wasn't really paying to that because I was paying attention to Georgia. So I don't, from what I saw, the jurors, they did not pay any attention to Rajpal during Georgia closing because I was like looking around the room, seeing what everybody's doing. And I didn't see anything where they're paying attention to him. And it's not like you could hear them talking. So I thought that was um that was that's not that's not an appropriate thing to do. You never talk to your client during someone's closing argument. Never. That is like a no-no is as a professionalism in the courtroom as a trial attorney. You don't do that. And uh you don't interrupt your your uh opponent either, unless you do have something that you believe you really will win a uh, judge's ruling on. So I think I remember Rashbaum one time objecting to something she says, not in evidence. And the judge then let her continue on because it wasn't evidence. So, and so Rashbaum was wrong on that. So Stella K is asking, uh, when Wendy lies about allowing grandparents meeting with her grandchildren, can that actually be used against her? Or is that just going towards portraying her character? Well, I mean, it, it's um, it's really both. And so you do have a way of introducing character traits for people. Like like you can call a witness to say that uh, the Venom's character trait is, uh, you know, peaceful, law-abiding, uh, nonviolent, uh, truthful, all those kind of things. Those are like character type evidence that we have rules of evidence that cover that. But if you just want to bring up stuff about what this person's done with regard to that shows motive or shows uh, reasons uh, that the uh, crime would have been committed or makes it look like they're uh, benefiting from the crime, then all that kind of stuff is just admissible for guilt um, and not just character. So. Yeah, that's a good point here from uh, Alex Perkins. When Charlie's there because he's guilty, somehow he misses his part. The obvious point is Charlie has zero accountability. And he was if he was innocent, he'd be screaming uh, it from the nonstop. Yeah, he would be. And he's it's just like a muffled, well, I'm innocent. So. Patty Gee is saying, if you saw emergency vehicles in the neighborhood where your ex lives with your children, would you drive off and go to lunch with your friends? Would you call the daycare to check on your kids? She did none of that. Well, keep in mind, it's not in a neighborhood. It's actually right in front of the house that your kids spent the night in, the night before, that morning. You don't even know if they've got made it to uh, the daycare or not. So, um, yeah, I mean, not checking on the kids and going to trust God. That's one A and one B for those two things alone could convict Wendy. And then you, you show denial of visitation and then also the name change. Those four, those four things done, stick a fork in it. There's no jury in America that would acquit her or be a hung jury. They would, they would be like ready to convict. I just hope the state attorney's office sees how strong that case is. Um, excuse me. Here's a, um, any word on who will be Donna's tally attorney? Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to talk about that on uh, in two nights on New Year's Eve. I think I'm going to jump back on and talk about that because I, I have a I have a a number of things I can say about that and things that I can say from a defense attorney perspective on what what are the pros and cons of things that uh, both from a uh, Tallahassee attorney perspective as well as how that's going to play with her, her current um defense counsel Rashbaum staying on the cases that appears uh julie nelson saying interesting that no jurors gave interviews good good sign of serious and not fame sinking yeah well i think i was thinking about that today because you know a lot of times jurors want to be interviewed and stuff like that just think about how they were trashed by charlie um they're like on if you had just kept his mouth shut, maybe they would say something and maybe they could find something, let's say through hypothetically to, to uh, have as grounds for a mistrial or something like that. But 
by him just blasting away at these folks being a bunch of uh, low life, uh, non intelligent uh, knuckleheads that are uh, everything has to be dumbed down on a third grade level. They don't, they're not educated or successful people. He basically said uh, three of the guys look like they had uh, never even had a girlfriend before or something like that. So I'm just nonstop insults to the jury. So they're probably thinking, you know what? I better just keep my mouth shut because uh, this, this, these people are nasty and uh, I'm not going to say anything to give them any grounds for uh, for any kind of uh, appellate relief. So, yeah, I think that that's a good thing. Uh, the one good thing about it is not only is it helping them prepare for arguments for uh, Wendy's and Donna's trials, but also it's um, it's helping perfect their case uh, from any kind of reversible error based on your uh, allegations of misconduct. Okay, Kayla O'Brien, what's your take on uh, Charlie Edelson's ex pal Ryan? He doesn't seem cre credible, really, to me, especially after seeing him disrespect a legal folks. G I don't know what that's about, so sorry. Um, but I, I think that uh, you know anybody who hangs out with Charlie is is uh, unless they've been reformed, is uh, definitely got you know some character issues. So and they went out overseas together, and what was Charlie doing overseas? So you you, you figure it out. But I. Um, I think he probably was telling the truth about what Charlie said about it. And uh, and there was more stuff they could have brought out, but what uh, conversations they had with Charlie and stuff like that about him um, telling him, dude, why are you not coming? Why are you going back to the United States? Why don't you just stay overseas and not worry about getting arrested down the road? And, and Charlie uh, never said something, well, because I'm innocent or anything like that. So I would have brought that stuff up as, as a prosecutor. But so I think overall, he was helpful enough as a witness. And, um, you know, if Charlie's hanging out with guys that don't have, that would lie about him and stuff like that. Well, then that's uh, that's that's on Charlie. But as a prosecutor, obviously you want to you want to call witnesses that you believe are presenting credible information. So I, I thought that was credible when he uh, brought up the fact that Charlie said, "If you keep your mouth shut after murder, you'll be all right." He says that he didn't follow his own advice, right? Once the once the uh, undercover bump happened. Grandma Maiden said, was Wendy correct when she said it was unconstitutional about grandparents' laws? I just know that um, I'm, I'm not a family law attorney, but I've done some uh, couple of family law things over my entire 33 years. But uh, <clears throat> in any event, only only a couple things, but I have some general familiarity with it. And I know one of the things that uh, different states have tried to pass that over the last decades and uh, Supreme, Supreme Courts, different states have struck it down because they said, you know, it's up to the parents to decide the... Uh, the, what's in the best interest of the children, not the grandparents. So, um, but this was crafted very tailored uh, and, and uniquely to cover it in, in the event that um, there's a homicide involved in one of the parents and then the denial of visitations happens for the surviving members because um, uh, it's uh, it's definitely something that I, I believe is, uh, is uh, in the best interest of the uh, parents, uh, excuse me, the kids when a parent is convicted uh, uh, or about to be convicted, there's some allegations of uh, murder by the other parents. So I, I think it's a, it was tailored the right way, and it did help gain some leverage to be used against the Adelsons to get some visitation. Is it enough visitation? No, but um, yeah, I think I think the denial of visitation, though, that is such a huge dagger against Wendy that uh, bring that out of trial and how she's lied about it as well. Um, it's just they got they got a they got a. They're going to be able to rake her over the coals with that kind of stuff. So bring it on, Georgia. Yeah, uh, Jennifer Ray saying, Charlie spent a million dollars, picked that jury's well spent, moldy stapled money. Yeah. Um, Probably wasn't moldy uh, or stapled, but yeah, that was, uh, it's probably a million dollars. My, my wild guess, I have no idea, but yep, that's what he got. And uh, so glad he spent that money. I always like to see guilty uh, people spend uh, spend money all they can and uh, think they can bring in these high powered guns and uh, they're not gonna, they're not gonna change the truth. Leo and LJ, uh, they've been running around here. Oh, L little LJ is right over there sleeping on the uh, bookshelf. So I've heard them running around here. You guys probably can't pick up on that, but so far they're not climbing up on me. 
Joseph Anthony is saying, do, you, I, do I think Wendy will leave the country before she's arrested? There's a chance. I think it, it, she's maybe thinking about it in terms of like maybe she's got a year and a half left because if it takes a year and a half for mom's trial to go, uh, then, um, then maybe she'd be arrested around that time. So I think she's buying some time. But with her mom, if her mom wants to go speedy trial, she's got to be much more worried about, am I going to be arrested like in the coming six months because if my mom's trials kicks off in May, I could be arrested in May. So yeah, that's gotta that's gonna be really uh something serious she's uh pondering, I would say, unless she just wants to go completely uh cognitive dissonance route and just not even entertain that thought, but it's gonna be eaten on her, I think, at a minimum. So Blooming Gale saying, uh, do you notice the one thing missing from the jail hall calls? No mention of Katie's testimony, naming him as the mastermind. Very telling. He's not upset at Katie. Yeah, he he uh, he really didn't. I, I, he said something about Katie, but it was just it was just not something that was really like getting under his skin. So I can't remember what comment he made, but yeah, he's like he he didn't want to dwell on that. Yeah, Charlie complained it wasn't a jury of his peers. Okay, so you're gonna have. A jury of South Miami type people. I mean, what is he expecting up in Tallahassee? Shaquille O'Meal says Georgia just laid out the facts and the evidence. That's what she did, and uh, there was a lot of minutia of detail. So they're all very critical data points to to uh, drive the point home of how these people were communicating their their crime, and uh, it was brilliantly put together and. Um, Yeah, I think Charlie did think he was bulletproof. Mom made sure that they think all these all these uh, defense attorneys and, and their uh, consultants and all that would uh, be able to buy them a victory. Uh, do, here's a journey question. This is a good question. Do all defense attorneys tell their client that they're doing well or do they tell them the truth at some point? You know, um, I've... Uh, I'm just really shocked to, to if this is true, what Charlie said, I'm just shocked that, that he would be uh, told things are going that well. And um, I, I think, um, I think I would be able to tell my client in honesty how they have done. And uh, I would tell him, look, you know, you, you haven't, you, you really hurt, you really hurt us when you said this, this, that, and the other, you can't, didn't come, or you didn't come across likable. You came across too smug and flippant. I mean, but a lot of that, I would, I would, uh, I'd be talking to my client beforehand and trying to get them to, uh, you know, be humble and sincere sounding. But I mean, with a guy like Charlie, you can't, you can't change that. And I've had, I've had a client like that before. Now I'm thinking about, it. I had a client like that before. I, I could not change. And, um, um, but they, they really don't, um, a lot of clients like that, they don't ask or want to know how they're doing. They're just, they just assume and presume that everybody's eating out of their hands, believing what they're saying. And uh, so, because I think a, a defense attorney should be telling the client, you know, that you're not, you're not sounding credible, that you're not going to have a winnable case. This theory does not make sense. You don't, you don't have a shot at all of, of getting an acquittal on this thing. And so I, but what other attorneys do and what they do in another state, I have no idea. Um, but like I say, if you believe what Charlie's saying, then do they really believe that, or were they just telling it? I don't. I don't I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna um, say what I think on that. But um, it just, it just worked out good for the prosecution that um, that Charlie got up there and he was so confident. If maybe if, if let's say if they would have told him, hey, hey, uh, you know, you don't sound very credible when we've uh, gone over your testimony before. You sound too much like a smart aleck and know it all and arrogant and all that kind of stuff and Maybe Charlie could have come across, try to come across more humble, but yeah, I just don't, I just don't see, I don't see it being in him at all. Not at all. You can't, you can't change his personality, um, even with a year and a half to prepare or longer. Uh, Wesley John Holmes asking, any idea when new calls will be available? I can't listen to the old ones any longer for the sake of my mental health. Yeah, I mean, there's that's pretty painful. I agree.
Yeah, New York Patriot lady saying Rosh is the best closer. Yeah, he, he he was saying he's known as you know being the closer, and his closing argument was so so terrible. It was just so ridiculous. Um, he, but he had nothing to work with. So, but yeah, it was. Um, I was just really surprised as a, as a uh, strategist and tactician in the courtroom. I would never, if you stop thinking about, it, he started his closing argument right around lunchtime around noon as i recall and i maybe it was something that the judge required that they couldn't take a break for lunch or something like that but i i was like i would have like strenuously objected to the judge and said your honor these jurors are hungry i'm hungry i cannot effectively argue they cannot effectively consider what and, and process mentally what i'm saying if all they have on their mind is food i, I would have like i would have like really driven home that point if uh if i was on a case like this and, and the judge expect me to have my closing right when people's stomachs are growling <laughs> i know i know i was hungry and i was like let's get out of here and i thought we were getting ready to leave and i'm like what he started his argument and i'm like okay well this is like really start off bad for defense and i thought hmm is he gonna shorten us at closing argument maybe that's the benefit of having to sit here through while we're starving but <clears throat> nope he went on over two hours I think it was two hours, 20 minutes, I recall. Very painful to listen to. Very painful. Okay, so Quantum Wannabe saying, according to Charlie, Rashbaum told Charlie that there was no chance of an appeal. That's a conflict to tell him he could easily win just thinking, well, um, but if you do have all the evidence you wanted in, the judge gave you rulings that you expected to bring right down the middle. There's nothing radical about what the judge uh, did or the prosecutor said. I mean, that right there shows you, though, that you know, Georgia did not make up facts and, and talk outside the record that was developed during the uh, during the uh, prosecution's case in chief. Because if that was the case, he would have uh, uh, objected. And if he failed to object, then that's maybe grounds for ineffective assistance counsel or something. But I, I don't see any of that being having any merit. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's what he meant by that. There's no chance of appeal because of the those issues I just mentioned. So. Um, because if a jury doesn't buy it, then you're trying to look at well, what evidence is there that could set aside and they're saying the jury didn't have enough evidence to decide on that. So now there's, there's enough because uh, it, it, there's so much of it that directly implicates Charlie. Okay, here's a question on uh, Law and Lit. What are Donna's chances for change of venue? Change of venue, I don't see happening. Change of venue is really hard to accomplish and uh, generate enough evidence that, you know, the, the potential jurors are so well following this case that there's no chance and you can really find anybody that doesn't have a formed opinion about it and and whatnot. And uh, so it's such an, it's not a recent case either and whatnot, so I just don't see that being happening. It's very rare. And uh, in most states, I think that'd be the same there. I hear um, Himona's asking, do you, I think the reason Charlie's quite about McBan on the calls is because she still has damaging info. And if yes, do you think she'll say more since her appeal is over? Um, I don't know their appeal is over yet. I've not seen that, but um, I, I think it all depends on how much she's willing to uh, say something that doesn't conflict with what Sigfredo would want her to uh, keep quiet about. So I think that's more of an issue rather than whether her appeal is final or not. I guess if it is uh, over with, then maybe she would be interested in that. It's possible. I just don't know. But I, I definitely I think she knows more that she's not talking about. But it's uh, these, these these people are just so strange in their, uh, their ability to... Uh, to make smart decisions and uh, beneficial decisions to their to their cases. So Debbie Gibby saying, 
see i would have brought the cop back who saw when he drove up the crime scene tape to prove she was lying for the 20th time mm -hmm. well he already testified that she had been there a car that looked like her and stuff like that so um I, I think that they already brought that out initially um and i think that was before wendy testified so that already made her out to be a liar so i don't think they need to rebut it because it's already spoken but um they definitely got that Didi's asking, will Charlie move back to Miami to be near his family so it'll be easier for them to visit? What's left of the ones that's not in jail, that is? Yeah, I just don't see them. Um, I think I think the highest price real estate is the southern, most southern parts of Florida, so I don't think you're going to have any maximum security type prisons down there. I think they're going to be up in the uh, north, very, very extreme northern parts of Florida where there's a lot of swamps and forests and stuff like that. Yeah, society page, uh, 95 out of 1,000. Yeah, uh, that's probably stretching as well. Um, that's, yeah, that, that's, the, that's how he scored 95 out of 1,000 on his testimony. That's a good one. Maybe you could do a video on that. That'd be a good one, a video of how Charlie scored. I'm sure you could come up with something in, in uh, short order. Hold up some flashcards or something showing how his attorneys are showing how he scored. <laughs> oh, Kitty's in the back. Okay. Oh, that's funny. He's stalking in the background. I don't, I don't, can't tell what they're doing behind me. Judy Clark saying his whole demeanor was fake. That slow blink never has stayed with answers. It means he rehearsed every line in his last. Call. Yeah, I mean he's been he rehearsed that so many times, but even then he wasn't. He didn't have some good answers on some of that stuff. Somebody even pointed out that. Uh, thank you for your email. They pointed out that um, I think I got it yesterday that they said if you noticed when Charlie was testifying, he said he learned about the murder on the nineteenth, but yet he said he got extorted on the eighteenth so georgia didn't follow up with that so anyway that's but it's probably some on the jurors like you had picked up on that so i, th I think that's that's the whole thing the prosecutor doesn't have to mop up and everything because jurors have 12 minds eyeballing all the inconsistencies in his story versus just one Yeah, Rashbaum is a white collar criminal defense attorney. It's not his special specialty. Says so Beachy Stacy, and uh, yeah, I mean, not he's not violent. He's not a violent crime guy, from what I've seen. But not that you have to be. But man, it really helps. It really helps the more violent type crime you've had. So, and uh, Mister. Betsy says, I believe Rashman did the best he could for Charlie. It's not his fault. The jury did not believe Charlie's lies. Yeah, I mean, it's the client wants to go to trial and he was not going to plead guilty. He doesn't want to admit any responsibility. Then, you know, let, let, let your crazy defense theory get out there. And, um, man, that's gotta be tough to have to argue something. He knows it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna. <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk about uh, Rashman's motives. Okay, so Wood Owl said Charlie said Dugan and Rashman conducted um, fake trials with lame defense. Can you comment on the strategy and defense lawyering? Well. I think what they did, what I heard Charlie saying, he said they had 20 or 25 people that got on the phone and, and questioned them, and they all thought, you know, everything was good and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, who are these people they, they polled? And how much do they tell them about the case from the prosecution standpoint? If you, get, if you don't go into enough details on what your case is and what the opposite, uh, the, your opponent's case is, then you're, you're really not going to get a good, good read. And so, um, yeah, I, 
what 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 would those people be what would they be told and how could they possibly think that he was uh had a shot at an acquittal or even a hung jury it's just beyond belief for me but uh, i can say that this strategy a lot of times i think lawyers that have a lot at stake maybe it's a civil trial and you got a lot of money at stake and you want to know how and you don't have a lot of maybe trial experience or something like that you want to know how a jury would potentially view the case and like maybe it's more helpful to get client control and get your parties the parties to try to settle by saying look we can save you a lot of money here's what the here's what we have if you want to pay out like a huge verdict of you know 100 million versus a, this potential jury would would said they would have came back with uh, 10 times that amount so it, it's a way to get some kind of client control or something like that but um i know when i started out as an attorney that's what i did a whole lot because i'm like i don't i want to that's how I developed a, I feel like a talent for understanding what, how juries think is that I would have whatever case I had going to a jury trial, I'd run it by people that uh, had very diverse backgrounds and some of them very completely opposite types of uh, personalities and thinkers than me. And, um, and one of them in particular, a cousin of mine, he always told me, your client's going down. He's got no defense. Carl, this is makes no sense. And he would, he would give me some, reason why <laughs> and and uh so but it made me work harder made me work smarter and stuff like that and uh thankfully every time that happened he was wrong so um but you do need i think when if you're not experienced as a trial attorney you do need to develop that kind of a uh, understanding of how juries think by asking other people before you have your case so uh, people you can trust not to repeat anything back to your opposing counsel of course but People that you trust say, hey, look, and then give them, you got to give them an honest assessment, though. If you don't give them an honest assessment, as best as I as I could do it, I would tell them, look, this is what I think the defense is going to argue if I was a prosecutor or if I was a defense attorney. I said, this is what I'm going to argue, and this is what the prosecution's theory is. How would you interpret the evidence? What kind of things would you want to look for? What kind of things would make you inclined to want to convict? What kind of evidence would you think would be necessary to make you not want to convict? So those are the kind of questions I would ask, um, you know, these po juror, poll jurors, uh, potential jurors that I would have. And it worked out really great. It really helped me develop uh, this skill set. And uh, so anyway, because one person doesn't necessarily can't speak for, you know, the public like that, that are randomly pulled in. But I feel like I've been doing this for so much that I feel like it really is predictable. And so... I don't like it when one uh, trial attorney say, well, you never know what a jury will do. It's like, no, if you know the facts, you know the evidence, you know how to get into the level of detail and you have a compelling story of truth and it's it's based on truth, not just some uh, kind of far-fetched wild story like Charlie had, then you, then you, then you, from my background and experience, you, you will have good outcomes. So um, I just, um, I just think that, yeah, the, uh, that strategy can be beneficial, but like I say, it's it's a it's a garbage in, garbage out type um, process. Where if you don't, if you're not giving them straight story, then then you're just going to get a garbage result out of the end. So LNL Kid is saying, do I understand that Charlie got scammed trying to hire a hitman prior to using Katie's ex husband's uh, murder? Is that true? If it was that was true, was it mentioned in the trial? No, I understand that that was mentioned through some kind of jail informant that Charlie had given fifty thousand to somebody like the year before to try to do the hit on Dan, but they just took the money and ran, and so um, he was out the fifty thousand bucks and nothing to show for it. So as Star Moon's asking, Rashbaum and Marisol working together now? No, I think Mar as I understand, Mar Marisol is not going to be joining them. She's going to stay down there in Miami, and they're, they're going to get somebody else to replace her that's local. But that can be a problem in and of itself, and that's what I want to talk about in uh, my next live stream here, probably in two nights. Uh, Brady Star is asking, would I put Charlie on the stand? Well. I mean, you had no other way to present that evidence. It was only Charlie or or who. Nobody else would admit that that happened. So to have that kind of defense, Charlie absolutely had to. But like I say, even though he had to, it was so, such a ludicrous defense. It, it wouldn't have mattered. But um, if he would have not testified, then he probably would have blamed his attorney for not putting him on the stand or advising him to. So usually in criminal cases, the defendant does not testify. It's, it's not that common. But 
it all depends on what the facts are and how good the, the client's uh, testimony is and how good they, the attorney thinks they would be credible as a witness uh, to tell tell what happened from their perspective. So it's very, very uh, defendant specific, very attorney specific, how the attorney feels comfortable doing that. And also how much the government has really proven their case. Maybe they, they feel that the government's proven their case beyond reasonable doubt. And the only chance to, to, to reverse conviction um, is to get get the defendant's story out there in front of the jury before uh, before they get convicted. So, <clears throat> okay. Just to answer this, uh, why did you ban us for so long? Um, I've been fighting some kind of bronchitis thing going on for like the last week almost. So I was, uh, <clears throat> I even spent the, I was here alone with the cats for Christmas. So, um, that's what was going on. And you even notice I've been coughing some here tonight. So I'm not over out of the woods yet. All right. Lori O is asking, is that where the Wendy got the name gibberish from the word gibberish? I think it might be. Um, I don't know if there, that's some kind of a Jewish name or nickname of derogatory nature. Obviously it's derogatory. And so um, I, I would think gibberish does come from gibberish, but uh, you could Google it probably for a better answer than what I can come up with. But I, I think I did look up that one time too. And I Googled it and that, that's what's coming to mind. Yeah, Mr. Betsy says, uh, Charlie got away with murder for years. He thought he was free of any charges. Yeah, that's why I think he didn't go ahead and flee the country. He says, yeah, you're not going to get me up there. It's been that many years, and Katie's going to not get convicted. So, yeah, I think he just thought he's going to skate. Not worth setting up a new life in another country over something that's just a fear-based is what he probably thought. uh hey kitty cool ladies howdy uh how do you think that he would have done by simply trying to poke holes in the states it doesn't matter it, it's uh he could have not testified and this could have poked holes um i already put that out there my i did it on my first post on twitter today or x and uh and i thought it was important to show that like six, seven, eight months ago, whatever it was, I'm, uh, John had me do a video where I said, Charlie has zero chance of an acquittal. It's going to be a slam dunk win. And uh, so this wasn't a surprise. I mean, it was it was an expected outcome, and they had no, absolutely zero chance of winning. Zero. doesn't matter what attorney you get. doesn't matter what jury consultant you get. doesn't matter what state you go to, which county you go to, which city you go to. Unless you're going to get some really, you know, some – some really deranged people on a jury, uh, but standard, standard, um, you know, dyed in the wool kind of honest, uh, hardworking American family type people that uh, raising kids, raising a family, being good neighbors. Those kind of people are not going to not going to fall for any of this kind of smoke and screen, um, smoke screen type of defense from uh, from the Rosh bomb team. So. <laughs> Yeah, private eye posse. I found it interesting that Rajman convinced him of victory before trial and also up till closing, right? Um, but afterwards said there was no appeal. Well, yeah, I mean, but that's the way it is. I mean, you don't, you got to find some, uh, have kind of some kind of grounds, like a bad ruling by the judge or something that really went crazy and um, that it was prejudicial to a uh, fair administration of justice for the defendant. But, you know, I, I don't see anything here that uh, they got any um, standing on. So Jay's saying, I thought it was an attorney's responsibility to realistically advise your clients on all possible outcomes. Charlie act like he was completely blindsided. Yeah. So, but what happens if your client, if you know your client doesn't want to hear the truth? Because what happens is if you tell your client, you know what, you got zero chance. Like if I'm sitting in the room with a guy like Charlie, you know, it's just a matter of when I'm going to tell him the truth, but I'm going to tell him, do you realize that no mat no matter who you hire as an attorney, you are you're not going to get acquitted on this you won't even get a hung jury this is like the easiest case that you will ever find for a prosecution to win 
on any kind of felony case, let alone a murder one case. So it was that much, uh, it was that much, uh, in the bag for the prosecution. And, you know, if a client doesn't want to ask you that, then maybe a lot of attorneys aren't going to want to say that. And because what happens if I'm in there, I say that to Charlie, I don't care whether it's, you know, day one or day 10 or day hundred or a hundred, um, you know, a day, day before trial or, or whatever, they're going to want to, they're going to fire me. They're going to turn on me and they're going to be, they're going to be enraged at me for not believing in them. And they're going to say, I'm a bad attorney. And I just don't know how to size up evidence and all the stuff he's blaming the jury. That's what you'd be receiving as a lawyer. So ask yourself what lawyers want to be that candid with their client when they got, when they got a million dollars on the line. So that's my theory. And uh, so I'm not going to say what happened with Roshbaum and maybe he's, you know, maybe he said that to Charlie or whatever, but I have my suspicions, but, um, you know, the bottom line is, uh, if Charlie didn't want to ask for it, then Charlie wouldn't have got it. And Charlie's maintaining his innocent and all that kind of stuff. And so it do doesn't sound like he was, would ever even entertain the idea of it, that those kind of words coming out of Rashman's mouth, which is like, Hey, you know, you, you might want to reconsider, uh, going, going, uh, contest the trial on this and, and, and cut a deal. So. It would have, it would have like really severed the attorney client relationship and, and probably um uh, severed it for good it's something you probably can't recover from with a guy like charlie Okay, so uh, Tammy y, v, or y is saying, but I completely agree with you that Daniel was lying through his teeth when he told Charlie that because Charlie did awful, and you're right, the people leaving the courtroom proves it. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not saying that he's lying, okay? I didn't say that, but if that's what you interpret I was saying, I'm, I'm merely saying how he would say that, I don't know, because I'm, I'm just telling you from my perspective, as a trial attorney that's done many, many cases to jury, over the years and uh i just it's very easy i think for a trial experienced trial attorney to size up evidence and come to a rational uh conclusion that's gonna and, and what the probabilities are of a win and maybe Roshbaum doesn't you know you, you can be in a trial attorney for 30 40 50 years and not be any good at predicting what a jury's gonna do because you don't really have an ability to read a room and so i don't know what, if Roshbaum doesn't just didn't know how to read the room or he got too caught up in trying to please Donna all those years before he got retained by Charlie. And then he's really representing both of them all. And um, somebody was telling me that uh, Roshman was saying that his, uh, his wife was having dinner with, uh, with Donna before, um, before she got arrested or something. So, I mean, it's like that, that's just very, I, I try not to say that close to a client that's facing such serious charges because you want to have, you know, you want to be totally objective. And the more you get subjectively tied in and your lifestyle revolved in, in with your client and stuff like that, that's just going to, that can put blinders on your ability to, to uh, see the case from a new perspective as much as possible. So um, that, that's my, that's what my, my take is on that. Okay, so anyone that believes a defense attorney belongs in jail says Ronald Mayo, but uh, I, I would, I would, I hope that's not true because um, I've had many, uh, I've had many cases I've wanted a jury to believe in me, and they have. So, um, so I hope you're not saying those jurors should be in jail. And uh, I thought they all did the right thing. So we do need to, not everybody's guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. So um, the government's got to prove their case, and that's the best way we should have it. We're just talking about evidence here and how the evidence indicates guilt and whatnot. So ultimately, um, what we say here doesn't matter. What matters is what's uh, proven in the court of law, obviously. uh here we have hey mona saying i think he said i'm not an appellate attorney and they're expensive uh 
that sounds like something I might've heard as well, um, that he doesn't do appellate work. And I think he said, don't spend too much on it too. So, um, because you don't have much of a shot. And so I just thought that was a weird comment to add. I mean, I, I would think if you got nothing to, to live for at that point, um, money's not gonna, you're not gonna go for the cheaper of the two, but who knows? Okay, I'm going to do a few more questions here. Oh, happy birthday, Maya. <laughs> Slam dunk under the jail. Yeah, Bloomingdale. I agree with that. As a matter of fact, it has a good question. Do you think that when Charlie goes to prison, he'll hear the truth about how the trial and Wendy's not caring about him? Yeah, that's that's potentially the case. And, um, you know, there was, I was trying to find out what kind of access uh, the folks have there in um, Florida prisons to phones and tablets and that kind of stuff, because normally prisons should not have that kind of stuff. But I think, I think things have gotten so lax over the last years that uh, now they allow them to have as much interaction with the outside world as they as they can, I guess, feel comfortable with. And so maybe they do have access to the internet and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, maybe, maybe Charlie's going to go through all this stuff and come up with stuff to, uh, to really, uh, get under skin and figure, you know what, man, I got to go after my sister. If I have no shot ever to getting out of here, Wendy's going down with me. Yeah. Old one windy old bird is asking, has Charlie seen Wendy's police here. I would assume so. I mean, that should have been on the discovery thing, and I'm sure he would have to have, unless he just didn't um, want to see it. But keep in mind that was out in the public domain on YouTube well before he got arrested, so he could have seen that way before. <laughs> um, starting to get harder uh, to talk here. Yeah, Karina J is asking, has Donna requested speedy trial? I've heard mixed information. She's not asked for a speedy trial through uh, her Miami lawyer, Descalzo, but she's word, used words similar to that, but did not, did not demand speedy trial. So she let the judge know, speed things up, sort of telegraphing that there could be turn, uh, turning into a demand for speedy trial. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see how close I mean, 8:45. Oh, I'm way behind. Sorry, I'm way behind on some of these. All right, Georgina Biggs asks, "Is there any tuners worth the high price they charge?" Yeah, there there can be some. I mean, there's some. They can they can make it worthwhile. I I think. I mean, there's some though that I think are just so outrageously high. It's just unbelievable just really outrageous but like i say it's not worth it i mean if you don't have a, a good case like in this one with charlie i mean um you know the cheapest attorney out there a public defender would would, would done just fine because the outcome's going to end up the same save the money for the kids Uh, Sadie's asking, does anyone know why no further jail calls have been published after the ninth? Apparently, that's maybe what the state attorney's office didn't want uh, to get out more than that. So I don't know if they're gonna release another batch every week or how that works. I'm not I'm not um I'm not up on that. Amy C is wondering if Wendy has tried to keep up with the friendship of the people she went to lunch with that day, just in case they get the call to testify one day at trial. I can see her doing that. Yeah, I think one of the uh, Tolva or something is her name. I think she's still in contact with her, and she's actually somebody that says has a PhD or something in in psychology. And uh, of all things, her her specialty is like having. Um, um, children, uh, counseling children that have had their uh, 
parents, uh, parental alienation type issues. Um, so yeah, imagine that. And then your best friend is somebody that doesn't allow the Markels access. So that's that's something I've seen on other on other channels, but. Roger Dub is asking, did Willie Mix have any relations with the Adelsons? Um, well, not directly, but keep in mind that the Adelsons had connections with some state senator that would have been in town a lot during the uh, times he's in this Senate was in session there in Tallahassee. And um, yeah, with, uh, with, with friends in high places, you'd be surprised the kind of deals they can work for you without, without any kind of paper trail or money trail or anything like that. M. Christine's asking, uh, Charlie's story had major holes. Why didn't Rochbaum make sure to address them with Charlie before the trial? I mean, you, you can't, you can't, you can't turn that uh, ugly pig into a beauty queen. You, you just can't. I mean, it's, it's just not possible. It's just not possible. I mean, you, I mean, you have, like I said before, I didn't, I didn't want to speculate what his defense would be, but I knew you can't get around what he said on wiretaps. You can't get around, um, what um what he what he said to at the dolce vita about hiring uh getting the bump guy killed about fleeing the country all that kind of something that that's uh, all those scenario based uh, conversations you have with katie um trying to calm her down for not freaking out thinking that the law enforcement is ready to nab him any moment so yeah i mean he was losing control he's losing control of the situation that's how he responded like a cornered rat Uh, Freddie Cat Jen is asking, do I think Georgia is being courted by other cities to join their team of prosecutors? She could probably name her price, but it seems like there's enough crime to keep her busy. No, that's not the way it works for uh, prosecutors. They they basically have enough applicants that they don't worry about recruiting other people from other jurisdictions or other states or anything like that. So no, I don't I don't see that. That doesn't happen to anybody that I've ever heard of. So um, and uh, so. They could probably name her price. No, they, these are state employees. They're, they're not paid decent enough to really make it worth their long-term career. You re really have to be dedicated to justice, which is good. And, uh, but yeah, they're not, they're not. Sorry, I hit a wrong button here, and I don't know how it took me off of a uh, stream yard here. So I think I'm back. Yep. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, here we have Side Barbie saying, paying big bucks to clean up the Dolce video was money well spent. I don't even think it costs big bucks. I mean, if you Google, digital video enhancement they're all over the place i mean there's multiple ones in florida they're like all over any kind of big city you're going to have that so um and i think that guy might even done it for free or something like that so it's not i don't think it's big bucks at all and it, you know whatever the rate is it doesn't take that long i think they have software programs that do it so it probably can be done really fast is my guess All right, looking for some red question marks here or triple Qs. Arlene Potash is saying, isn't it true that if Rashbaum knew the extortion defense was a big lie, he was supposed to let Charlie give his narrative on the stand and not participate in questioning him? No, that's if Charlie told him, hey, I'm going to make up this story. I want to get on the stand and make up this whole story about the extortion defense. Then an attorney's not supposed to participate and he could withdraw motion to the court say i withdraw i have a conflict um, or if he does want to stay on the case to not assist the client at all in any of his testimony he basically just have to sit there and charlie get up on the stand and start talking his nonsense and then he'd sit down and then he'd basically um probably couldn't even argue what charlie said was credible so i mean that's, that really looks bad in front of a jury
but no, he was not, um, unless you to a client's telling you, Hey, I want you to get up there and lie for me. And this is what I want you to, uh, that's what I'm going to lie about. And this is what I want you to argue. Uh, it doesn't work that way. All right. I don't know why I'm trying to scroll up and it knocked me out there. Sorry about that. All right. I'm just going to do a couple more questions here. Mandy Strong is saying, who would carry out a hit for a complete stranger for payment after the fact? When you haven't coordinated ahead of time? Absolutely. Katie's still lying. Yeah. I mean, she's not telling the truth about a lot of stuff, but I think the things like uh, when she was asked about from charlie about does she know anybody that can put the hurt on somebody that was in uh, like halloween uh, october 31st 2013 and uh so i think that was credible i think the money washed uh moldy and that kind of stuff was credible i think the fact that she showed up there that night was credible there's a lot of credible stuff she said so is she full being fully uh honest about everything is there is the truth just flowing out of her mouth uh real easily no but um there's enough there's enough other indicators of things she said that are have the credibility you need and that's why they put her on the stand also you could see that she's not a sophisticated person enough to be able to to extort that much money out of charlie without charlie going yeah right he charlie would have laughed at that if she would have said that he said oh where are they at i know where you live okay i'll, I'll call the cops he could have the cops over in two seconds and then have the cops go after Sick Fredo. I mean, that, this is not even credible. It, it doesn't work like that, as Charlie says, right? <laughs> uh, Sabina202 saying, if, did you see in their police interview, what do you refer to the killers as they? Seems like she knew more than, there was more than one killer. Dr. G pointed it out. Yeah, I think that's... um. I've not seen that part about Dr. G, but um, I th I think that uh, that is something that's very critical that uh, I need to add that to my list. So, yeah, that's something I don't have my list as of yet, but I'm, there's some more stuff I want to get on her um, five hours of testimony from um, things like that that are revealing. But, uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for highlighting that. There was also something else that... Um, like when she slipped up and, and said the hitman instead of the uh the geek squad guy you know she she has this awareness of hitmen being involved in dan's murder and it just seems like she has slip ups like that and that's what happens with con um when folks are going in there and they're trying to be so scripted when they're talking to police and stuff like that they have those type of slip ups yep All right, I did it again. Sorry, I don't know why I'm doing that. But anyway, all right, I'm just going to say one last question uh, from Michelle. Do I think Donna will testify? Well, I think that Donna has to testify if she's going to get up there and say some other kind of ridiculous story like Charlie did. So um, I, I just think that she's she's uh, being in that solitary uh cell with lights on 24 7 and, and whatnot i don't think they're going to let her out before trial so i think she's going to be absolutely going stark mad crazy in there and uh so but yeah she's going to be chomping the bit if she goes to trial i think she's going to be chomping at the bit ready to ready to just unload unload she's going to be very angry and that's not going to come across good for the uh for the jury at all so uh oh thanks matter of fact very sweet of you so um bless you too and everybody else for this new year and like i said my plan is to come on in two nights so thank you for uh being supportive of the cause here just for markels and uh if you do have questions about the uh, attorneys and what what do you think is going on with the attorneys up there and and um uh, Tallahassee and Miami, are they going to join some uh, Tallahassee attorney? Why haven't we heard anything yet? Does that seem odd to you that we have not heard from uh, 
uh, anybody uh, finally notice of appearance and whatnot to uh, represent Donna. So anyway, that's the kind of stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that's what I plan to talk about in two nights. So hope to see you then. Otherwise, uh, have a safe and, uh, and uh, great weekend. Take care.